Okay, so uh, my name is Matt Pullen. Um, I am the Product Marketing Manager for Education here at Jamf. Um, and like I said, absolute pleasure today to be joined by three fantastic guests uh, telling us their stories around empowering student success. So I'm going to hand over to them to introduce themselves. So over to you, Miriam. Hi, I'm Miriam and I am currently based in Cork Education and Training Board in the role of Technology Enhanced Learning. Previous to this, I would have been a classroom teacher for close to 10 years, teaching digital media and coding. And half of those years would have been with iPad and Jamf um, in that role. In addition to this, I also support local schools in their iPad journeys and um, with everything from setup to unboxing to day-to-day -day teaching and learning. Uh, hello, my name's uh, Richard Anderson. I'm the Digital Transformation Lead for the Architecture Learning Partnership. Uh, we're a trust of 19 schools in the Midlands, and we've just started our one-to-one -one, uh, deployment across our whole trust, which will be taking place over the next um, 12 months or so. Um, so, looking forward to, to the impact that will have and discussing with you the, uh, the impact that's had so far. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is James Jackson. I have the wonderful job title of Director of Digital Transformation for the Shore Education Trust. We are based in the Midlands. We have roughly 30 schools in our trust. Uh, a year ago, I came into the position just over a year ago. We had one school with iPads. We are now one to one in 20 schools um, as of this morning, actually. Um, we've given out nearly 12,000 iPads um, in the last year, and we've completely changed our digital learning strategy across the board. A bit like Miriam and Richard, we're all ex-teachers. All of us can come from a background of knowing what it's like to be front and center in front of the classroom. So it's not just we're not all techies that, you know, just throw technology at people. We actually know what it's like. I did 12 years, you know, um, FE, HE, primary schools, universities, the whole lot. So it's all about delivering a, a great learning experience from my point of view. Absolutely. And, and absolutely thrilled to have you all here. And like you, I equally I'm an ex-educator as well, so I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a fantastic conversation um, in the next hour. Um, so let's let's kick things off. Like we're here to talk about student success. So let's start by just having a look at where did you start in terms of that journey, thinking about student success and how technology was going to support them. Richard, I'll I'll throw that to you first. Yeah, of course. So. Um... Before working for the Architecture Learning Partnership, I was um, a teacher and um, sort of iPad lead at Mere Green Primary School, which is a part of the Trust. Uh, and we started our one-to-one -one journey back in 2017, uh, where I was the first teacher to sort of, sort of trial um, that and uh, sort of really had to change my whole approach to it. And I really saw firsthand the impact it could have. Um, once that trial, that um, sort of, uh, really showed the, the success. We decided to go for it across the school. So we looked at three core drivers, uh, independence, external access and accessibility for our hard to reach learners. Um, and they were our core drivers that we kept on going back to uh, each point through our digital transformation. Um, so beyond that, we managed to really transform our school community from our parents to our staff to our children as well. Fantastic. James, is that echo your kind of approach or did you did you start somewhere different? What was what's your story and your your in the journey? middle there? Really. <laughs> yeah, sort of. I know Richard really well. I, I, we're only about 20 miles down the road from each other a little bit. So I could run into Richard quite a bit. Um, we were sort of halfway between when I came into the trust. They, they'd had this thought around they needed to be they want to go into digital. It's something they want to do, but they weren't sure where they'd be. Also, um, we have a diverse collection. You know, we've got special schools, we've got prus, we've got secondaries, we've got primaries. We've got a complete diverse collection in some very different areas of the country as we as we go up. So, with us, this once this sort of how do we do this took on a different dimension because you know we've got schools who hadn't had IT investment in ten years before they came to the trust. So, one of the first things I had to do was do an evaluation exercise with the schools about where are they. There's no point putting iPads in if they haven't got Wi-Fi. So, and that was actually a discussion at one school. So what we came up with for our digital strategy was what we call, I don't want to say six pillars because I hate pillars in digital strategy. We've actually got a framework. So what I built with schools is a framework. So you start from the bottom, which is 
envisioned is the bottom level, which is we'd like it, but we haven't got it yet. All the way up to naturalized through five different stages of actually we don't even notice we've got this. So we're only at naturalized in one school for one area of the six columns we've got. But each one, you can tell I used to work for Pearson. Frameworks are my thing. I did too much work with BTEX. So for me, I'm used to a nice framework. It fits well. But it works well with large scale trusts because ultimately not every school is going to be in the same place. And our trust doesn't do directors dictate and schools follow. Our schools lead and we help them to get to where they want to be. So it's been a very different approach to us. I don't dictate what our schools do. I give them a framework and they tell me where they want to be. And then I help them work in the best way possible. So it's very, very different to other large trusts. Our, our trust has got a whole approach around the head teacher's lead. And that's their job. We are here to help get them the best they possibly can from where they want to be. So for us, it was about where does this school think it can fit? How can we get them there? But also one of the things we found, I'll probably discuss it a bit more later, is the outcomes are massive. Um, I know uh, your jumps colleagues, Matt, know the numbers I'll probably throw out later because I did my master's research last year and the improvement is insane. The actual level of improvement we got from going one to one iPad, that number is off the chart. And it was all from some research I did last year. Yeah, well, you know, look forward to to hearing more about that later, and I'm sure sure all of our viewers are going to be as well, because obviously that we talk about student success, how do we measure those things? You know, that's going to be something which really is important. Miriam, over to you, and I'm going to kind of pose it slightly differently as well, and, and almost tease out like why iPad as well, because I know you've done some some fantastic things in the past, and and you've had some great student success. Maybe a little bit more about why iPad within that as well. Yeah, so for us, um, like it's the same as what James and Richard said. I was teaching a few years and my teachers weren't, or my students weren't your typical students. They were coming back to education. They're all adult learners. Some of them would have been in the workforce. Some would have been unemployed. Maybe they'd raise families and come back. Some might have left school early. And as, um, as a college, we would have had a massive history with Apple. We would have like seven, eight, iMac labs and what I was teaching I was teaching digital media we were using the pro apps we we're using the Adobe apps Final Cut Logic but sometimes within the space of a year they were too advanced for my students you would have students that may just think this is too difficult I can't do it and they would drop out and at the level that I was at it was too high a level to be expecting them to be pros at those um, I was really lucky I was only a year into teaching when I was introduced to the Apple Distinguished Educator community and I remember standing in that room um, with my vice principal at the time and he's like you could be one of those and I was like no these people are like <laughs> next level um, but that opened my mind to creating your own textbooks creating your own student resources and I kind of went away from that particular event with like a new energy that I could do to things differently and it took a few years, like I didn't get iPad that year or even the next year, it was a few years later. And then it was trial and error. And like James, I saw the results. So I saw the students creating iMovies, winning video competitions, um, coding, like doing all these advanced projects that you would think you would need a pro app to do. Um, and they were able to do it on their iPad. And yes, we still had the iMacs. So we were able to take them to the next level afterwards, but it gave those students that in and that encouragement to get started, to stick with it. And they could see the results because the results were more instant. So for me, it was as a result. And the fact that no student had to be left behind was a winner and um, I'd seen it in other schools, but I think it's one of those things you kind of need to see for yourself. You need to see those students and their final projects and just think back to the start of the year and the successes you make. And iPad enables that. Yeah, I, I love that. And you kind of alluded. No, go on. Yeah, sorry, James. Go on. So I was going to add something because it was just something you've mentioned to Miriam that I actually missed. You know, the why iPad conversation. We did the research into other devices. It's probably worth mentioning here. There's, there's a couple of reasons we went with iPads overall, because we actually trialed like little Windows devices, you know, laptops and other things in some of the schools. We did do the trials. One of the biggest things, the two biggest advantages we found with iPads was one, cost effectiveness. 
because we can effectively get three iPads, especially if you're using things like Apple Financial Services, you know, because we, we do all of ours on AFS. We don't do purchase. We do all of ours on license because actually it makes more sense for refreshing of devices and school budgets and all those kind of things. But the other thing is the operability and lastability. So we have, te you know, we have students and teachers come in the morning with an iPad fully charged. They use it all day. It goes home. It's still got charge. They walk into a, a room and I'll throw one of the numbers at you. We've got lesson start time down from six to eight minutes. So that's when you walk into a room as a teacher, we've all done it, there's everyone on here. You walk into a room as a teacher and from you walking in the door to your lesson being started, we all remember logging onto Windows devices, loading everything up, hoping the device policies came on, waiting for the smart board to do up. That took about six to eight minutes we clocked it at before we put the iPads in. We've got it down to less than one because they walk in the room, they tap mirror and it's on the screen straight onto a screen. So those were the two big decisions for us. Sorry for adding on that, but it was just a useful, oh, right. it's not just about, you know, the teaching, you know, the teaching learning, we've got some great ones, we've all said it, but ultimately that that operability, and my techie loves me, the techie in all these schools now just changes passwords. He doesn't have to go and, you know, figure out why a HDMI cable's not working, why the audio's not working, why has that PC decided it won't be through, all that's sort of gone now, and it's very much operability of device as well as all the, the, the great learning outcomes as well. So sorry for interrupting that, but. No, no, and that's, that's a really, really good point. And it kind of brings me into the kind of next thing I wanted to look at. But but just focusing on that, I think, you know, these devices in the hands of a teacher, if you can save teacher time, and we all know educators have, you know, issues around workload and time management and all of those things, I think any saving, it, it sounds almost like nothing, right? A, a, a six minute saving on the start of a lesson. But as we all know, if you've been in a classroom, that that's valuable time for, for anybody and to, it's not I suppose it's not just about the saving the time it's also trusting that the, the tech is going to work for you you know teachers put an awful lot of effort into planning lessons and you want to know it's going to work right otherwise you won't have that trust in the devices so I think that management piece behind it is is really really important so let's kind of pick that up then um, Richard I'll, I'll throw this to you first um, and, and Richard and James you both alluded to this Let's talk about scale here then. You know, you've talked about having maybe some iPads at first to now having, you know, huge one-to-one -one rollouts. What does that look like? How do you do that? Yeah, I think um, for us, looking at our digital, digital strategy going from one school to 19, 20, it will be uh, very soon. Um, we obviously looked at the successes that we had at Mere Green, but also probably focus more on the learning points and what we'd do separate, uh, differently next time. So touching on something very similar to James, a key thing is the buy-in and the uh, reduction in workload. So for us, we did a lot of research on printing. So we found that Mere Green, there was a reduction between 50 and 80% uh, in printing reduction, which obviously means more time for the things that matter, like planning lessons and less time for the things that don't mean as much, such as printing. Uh, we also found through increased um, efficiencies with apps like Shobi that we were saving on average around five minutes per lesson uh, with much less cutting, sticking and those inefficient activities that people spend so much time on. So we took those successes about what went well, but also things that we probably do differently, um, looking at potentially the funding. James again alluded to it with AFS, how we don't need to purchase the iPads. Uh, we can have a much more financially sustainable model um, and looking at reductions we can take elsewhere like printing and other things we can fund it ourselves so parents aren't having to uh, fork out any money for an ipad um, this is all about making it equitable and for us with our drive the driving force even probably above the teaching and learning was that equability making sure that every child no matter whether they were in a leafy suburb school in Sutton Coalfield or a school in Erdington that they had access to exactly the same device, but also the exact uh, the teachers had exactly the same access to uh, training as well. The next thing we did was obviously invest in the infrastructure. As James said, can't be putting 1,000, 2,000 devices in a school that doesn't have the infrastructure for it. So our deployment model uh, was based around the infrastructure type, the timeline as well. So we've got uh, eight schools going live in January and then another uh, 11 in September and that was fit around the infrastructure work as well um, then it was on to that sort of clear vision and purpose I've touched on it about the equitable access 
um, that sort of wider reducing of digital poverty. We saw that, especially in COVID, the difference in the schools that had technology and those that didn't, and the sort of reduction in learning loss that that supported. Um, but also, of course, the enhancement to teaching and learning, how we can use this as a tool to enhance teaching and learning, not something that's a side, a bolt on to what we already do, but something that's immersed in everything, in every lesson, in every subject. Uh, we then looked at case studies from different schools. I actually spoke to James before we, um, before we rolled out, heard about what he was doing. We had a lot of knowledge in primary, but not so much in secondary. So really finding out those case studies of schools that have done it, learning from them what went well, but also what potentially we may do differently. Um, and again, for us, just developing a real clear strategy on how we're going to implement it. It's a huge implementation, a big change, probably the biggest change that a school could go down realistically or a trust could go down. So we've identified the top five, the digital classroom, five core things that we believe will make a difference to each teacher in every lesson. Um, and that's what our whole CPD model, uh, model revolves around. And it's the mantra that we'll keep on going back to over the next two years. Uh, so a really uh, steady pace, making sure that we bring everyone with us. We've got that buy-in from showing that it's reducing workloads and it can also enhance uh, pedagogy and day-to-day -day practice. Sounds great. James, is that kind of similar? I mean, you just you, you threw out like 12,000 as a figure before, like that scale, right? I, you can see that, yeah. that's huge. Is that a similar it, kind of story for you? It's frightening when you look at it, because as I said, when I first joined the Trust 14 months ago, 15 months ago, we had 100 iPads total. Um, and I say now looking down the nose of by December, it'll be 12,000 and by the end of next year, it'll be 16,500. Um, it's a, quite a significant jump in a very, very, very short space of time. And what makes it different for us is the way our trust operates. So unlike Richard, where they're driving it centrally, we're not. I have a centralized strategy and it goes, but the schools drive it. So ultimately, we only go when they are ready. So every single school goes at the point they are ready. We had some schools go last year. I'm in and out of one of our biggest secondaries at the minute because they're going this. They're going currently. So their year sevens are the last bunch to get them. Or 11 through eight have already got them their year sevens get them next Monday and we've been steadily rolling them out. So students and staff, the only two key tenants I have is one staff, get them first. So staff get them six to eight weeks minimum before the students do, because I will not have staff not feeling confident and competent Two very different things with that device before getting them out. And then I want, you know, the thing is, I know this, I've taught computer science for years. You will teach a bunch of students and they will go past you. So one of the worst things you could ever do as a teacher is go, I know everything because you really don't. So one of the things I've had to work with staff to do is get them to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. So it's the, if you're unsure, ask one of your students, they're probably going to know. So don't just feel like you have to know everything. They're going to quite enjoy it and let them come up with some interesting ways. So one thing we haven't done is we haven't dictated to our schools. Some of our schools use Shobi, in fact, most of them do, but some of our schools use Teams because they work better that way. A couple have got Seesaw. You know, we let our schools dictate the model that suits them because we're spread across effectively 300 miles. You know, all of our schools are in very different areas, areas so I have to be able. The only thing I require is that we control all the apps so we use jump school to its ultimate whereby we only we limit the apps so they have to come to me with an educational reason i assess the app and so there is a level of control in there but it means a bit like richard and i'm sure miriam's going to say the same thing when you're training them you can you know what you're training them on and i do a lot of our staff training so it means when i'm saying here's how you use classroom manager here's how you use minecraft in education here's how you use seesaw here's how you use um Shobi. here's how you use um the, the bit I'll add on is we, we have a bit of a mantra that is Apple device, Windows software. So we use Office. The Apple software is there, and some of our primary schools use it. Secondary is less so, apart from um, occasionally uh, GarageBand and iMovie. But in terms of actual software, they use Word, PowerPoint, Excel, because that's what they're used to, and that's what they feel, especially with a lot of our students who are 16 plus going on to later life, that's what they're going to need. So we have that sort of mini mantra. So for us, it's more about working with each school and figuring out what makes sense. So, you know, as Richard said, massive reductions in photocopying. You know, we, we've actually reduced our number of photocopiers. Our biggest secondary used to have 14. It's now got three because they don't need to print. 
ultimately they're, they're, they're airdropping, they're sending stuff through Shobi, they're sending stuff through Teams and OneDrive. They do not need to print. Everything is there, all the access is there. And that equity is amazing. And that's where we drive from. We drive from when you are ready, we will go with you and we will help. But it does mean other schools, we've got some schools who flew last year and then schools this year who are now being helped. So where we've got a mass specialist in one area who's amazing at iPads and amazing with using the iPad or Canva or an app that's really great. If there's another school going, our math department can't get it, right, pick that person up, bring them over, let them do some targeted training because they're ahead of it. And then this school might have somebody who's amazing at geography. So they pick up and we send them into another school to go and do. So for us, it's a, it's a very amorphous approach. In my head usually is like, where are we going with this? Um, it's probably a little bit crazy, but it's fun. Um, but it's about having that very adaptable approach for us because every school is different. And I do believe it's the way forward. I always have. But I think, and also with the way we work with Jump School and the way we work with our partner company, which is Sync, are great because it means we've got like a default set. So when we set a new school up, we drop it into Jump School. It's got all the same things. They all have the same backgrounds. It's all there. We have that clarity and that control of purpose. But that's a baseline. That means the schools and the staff feel like they've got something to go from. So we just baseline it for them and they can really take it forward. Because I know as an educator, the rest of us will know the same. We all do. We like to think we can do some interesting stuff without being told what to do. So just giving a baseline has always been a really key thing for us. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And, and again, just kind of to reiterate to, to everyone watching, you know, Office 365 on an iPad or Google on an iPad works perfectly well. If that's what your infrastructure is, it's going to work well. Miriam, I saw you nodding an awful lot talking about training, obviously, in, in your kind of role that you're doing now. Like, do you want to pick up on anything there around that kind of training of staff? Because scaling isn't just scaling like from 100 to 12,000 devices. There's people involved in that whole process as well, right? Yeah, there is a lot, especially what James is saying. There are a lot of that resonates with what we would or what I would see daily. Like I would be lying to say that I scaled where I was working up. That just didn't happen. It was not going to happen, um, which is kind of why I, I I knew the potential, but it was not the right environment. I was one to one across my courses, but it didn't go beyond that and it was just not going to happen but we're working with other schools like a lot of things that he said there um we do have the cluster skills that i would work would be within the same community so having that ipad that is set up that one way but you go to the school down the road also manage their ipads that ipad is set up in the same way um, so that if a teacher moves or if a student moves to that school down the road they're not going to have to start from scratch um, the only differences we would have are the ones that you would mention. If it's a Google school, it would obviously have those apps. If it was a Microsoft school, it would have Teams. And then we have the same, we have the core Apple apps that we would use all the time. And um, I have the same I, um, apps across all the students' ones in all of the schools. The only exception is a teacher can have whatever app they want. Um, I don't really put a rule on that, but it's just on their device. Like they can ask me for whatever they want and they can have it, but it's not going to be on their class one. Um, what that has allowed me to do is to have teachers ask me. So they have to have a reason because you're not going to ask for like a, a streaming app or a, a social app or whatever. Because like, yes, they don't know that I'm not going to go. Why do you need this app? Um, I really don't care. Um, but it means that they're just not going to ask for that app for everybody in their class. Um, but it does help with scale. And I think the other thing is communication um, and training. Teachers need to feel supported by their own management. They don't want me coming in as a threat, disrupting everything. Um, I know I did go into a school and they just got on Chromebooks and then suddenly I was there training them all in iPads and the principal, and I admire him for this, came in and he was like, we're not changing. Um, this is just um, something that we think will work for our students as well. And they, they have both and it works. It works amazingly. Um, but that one moment they'd gone in September to uh, like a one-to-one -one Chromebook uh, environment and several months later, they'd all these iPads and they were getting iPad training. And, you know, there's that fear you've invested all this time as a teacher or as a special needs assistant and you're starting over. But no, the, the fact that the communication from the top is clear is really important because I need to be, as an external person, I need to be supported going into the school and the teachers that I'm working with need to know that they're not going to just up and change something else next September. 
Yeah, fantastic. Some really, really good tips there on like supporting that scaling message. And, and again, we've kind of talked about it from infrastructure all the way through to training. I think there's there's a lot in there that has to be considered. Yeah. Right, let's let's change tack slightly now. Like you, you've all mentioned about using iPads. We've got lots of iPads in instances. Where are they being used? Like what's being done with these iPads? Are they used just in the classroom as they would have been as a you know a computer lab? Or what's what's changed in terms of iPad use? I don't know, probably the easiest thing for us, I'll, I'll start for once, I'll give you a break, Richard. Um, <laughs> what, we've got them everywhere. You know, one of the big things we found is teachers finding different ways. Our sports department at one of our schools, uh, Kids Grove, are amazing with them. Like they've gone textbook free this year. So their iPads are their device. You know, I've walked into one lesson and they're videoing each other um, doing basketball, for example turning around to their friend, bringing them over and drawing on the screen going, look, if you adjusted your shot angle by this much, you'd actually get a much better thing of this. There's a video of it actually with Jamp Differers of, of them literally adjusting it and showing what it could change, bringing up clips of basketball stars like split screen on the screen and saying, look, this is how this person does it. This is how you're doing it. Look at the difference in your movement. Look at what would happen if you changed it. We've got geography where if uh, we, we had them building, um, actually, no, history is a better example. History, we had them building um, Stone Age villages and medieval castles for year sevens and year eights in Minecraft. So they had to go off and do all their research first and do that. They're taking them out there. We've got um, geography flying the drone with the iPad. So we've got a load of small fleet of drones in a couple of the schools. They fly the drones out there and they go and do that. We've got arts, art uh, students building virtual art galleries with VR headsets. They're building them on the iPad passing them straight to the VR headsets. These are primary school kids as well. We're not talking secondary and not talking college. We're talking primary school kids who are using easily adaptable apps to generate different and new learning experiences that aren't your standard. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of them that are sat there in a classroom sometimes where they're using it as Google, you know, just so they want to help learn, enhance their learning environment. In um, food tech, for example, they use them sat in the screen. The, the screen is the recipe. So they can sit, they can see. But also, rather than just having a printed piece of paper as a recipe, they've got the recipe they've got. They can go and search, see how it's supposed to look. OK, that doesn't look quite how it should do when I'm stirring. Let's go look at a YouTube video that said. And actually, we're finding, um, to use two new educationalist terms, I mean, they've been around 15 years, but constructivist and connectivist, rather than old-fashioned humanist pedagogy stuff, you can tell I used to teach PDCE. So <laughs> constructivist and connectivist, where learners start to build their own networks of information, not just us. So it means they can say, look at what I found, look at where this is. They can build that, they can pass that back to their classmates. You're getting this, this more communal learning experience. And going, look at this, have you seen that? Look at how that works. And we're seeing classrooms turn from very sort of what I grew up in, unfortunately, didactic, very sat behind the desk classrooms to much more interactive learning experiences. How could we do this? How about we take a picture of that, bring that back? We get a much more freely moving classroom rather than just we're just going to sit here and do in English and, and write and annotate text. You know, we still do some of that because it's great and needs to be there. But also we're finding learners and staff are developing completely random learning experiences. And I've always said to staff for me, you come to me with an idea, I'll see if we can make it possible, like Miriam, you know, and Richard, I know, does it as well. You come to me with a concept, what can we do? What can we make work? What can we bring in? And for me, it's great fun. You know, we threw Spheros into a load of primary schools and they're busily driving them around primary schools, looking for ways around different pathways and learning basic alg algorithms. We've got one primary school doing pop-up playing cards using the AR kit, AR maker. So they're building like little graphics of like little kings and queens. And so with playing cards on them, again, what looks amazing to all the rest of us is actually fairly simple. So we're getting totally different learning experiences and totally different learning elements from a non-traditional piece. So we're trying to develop the non-traditional while still allowing them to focus on, yes, we know they've got exams to do. Yes, we know they've got the key stage exams, the GCSE, so they're still going to have to put it down. But we're finding that because they've had that more interactive and developmental experience, it's being reflected when they come to write it down because their memory's there. They've got this joined up element. So when they come to write it, they've got shared experiences to do that with. Yeah, exactly. I always love to hear PE examples, by the way, being an ex-PE teacher. <laughs> um, it's always nice to hear those those stories. Uh, Richard, what, what, what about your school experience? Like, where are the devices being used? And it might not just be in the school, right? It could be outside the school and, and beyond the school gates. 
Yeah, so I'm not going to touch on any more specific examples. I think James pretty much touched every subject <laughs> possible there. So um, for us, again, scaling from one school to 20, one of the most trans transformational things we saw uh, we're focusing on is iPads being able to go home. So um, from years one to 13, each child will take their iPad home each day over the weekend, over the holidays. And from what we've seen at Mere Green and what we're planning and the way we're implementing across the trust is just how much that will transform the whole school community. Um, sort of really removing the walls of the school so that learning can take place anywhere. You know, you've got if you've got year three children, year six children, if they haven't finished completing a, a really engaging activity and they want to complete it. They no longer have to wait until the next lesson next week or that's it. They can complete it at home. You know, the, the, the parents can be more engaged. We did a sort of video sort of selling our one-to-one -one device program and the children were talking about how they created a garage band and were using Chinese instruments and then showed it to their parents and then taught their parents how to, to, to use garage band as well. So it does just completely transform our whole school community. Uh, like James was talking about, yes, of course, it's fantastic for those important milestones such as yes, exacts. Uh, GCSEs, A levels, being able to have a device um, at home with you all the time, completely allows um, for an enhanced uh, opportunity for revision, etc. But beyond that, just having the ability to learn at any point, anywhere, uh, we've really seen it improve engagement, independence, um, and just a whole more inclusive school community. Fantastic. Miriam, anything to add there from your I think, observation? Yeah, from our side, James like stole all the ideas that everybody's doing. He said, I know he said you're overly enthusiastic. It's good because we're all overly enthusiastic. I think we could all talk for an hour on those and we all have our examples. It is removing the barriers, removing the barriers um, of the classroom walls. Um, like you have kids go, oh, I'm going to be back in two seconds. I want to just record a voiceover outside the door or whatever. And it's OK. They pick it up. They do it. You can trust them. They'll be back. They're not going to go like wandering. And it makes it possible. Um, like teachers at the start, I always kind of said, like, you're introducing the skills to the teachers because I mainly work with the teachers, but in their classrooms. And then the next stage is them integrating it. So like primarily I would work with everyone can code and everyone can create, which are two Apple curriculums with the Apple apps. So that's where I would start. We would introduce those skills, but then those skills would find themselves into geography and history and all the other subjects. And then it's when I walk into a classroom one day and the teacher is doing something that I never thought of. That's when you know it's working. Um, so they know that that magic me from Keynote or something with clips and, and they've thought of this whole other idea for us. That's when you know kind of your job's doing done and um, things are are going well. Same with students. And I think student choice comes down to it a lot. I know I was in a classroom last week and we were doing a, a drawing, a simple drawing shape activity. And I said, start with Keynote. And then I suddenly had a kid go, can I use Sketch at school? And I was like, why not? And then I had another kid go, oh, can I animate it with flip a clip and said, and I was like, why not? You can use whatever you want to use. They all had the same outcome, but they used what was comfortable for them. And that was important. Yeah. And I, and I love like all of that is transformational, right? We talk about like making a difference in, in student success and we talk about personalized learning and, and Miriam you just you just highlighted that perfectly right personalized learning sometimes is down to student choice like yes this is the task I want you to achieve but you don't necessarily all have to do it the same way and and that's really really nice and I suppose the device lends itself and then obviously as long as we're giving our teachers the devices that they know they can trust and that they're set up in the right way it, it just allows people to to do so much more I'm going to kind of pick up back on that. And, and Miriam, you mentioned some of this when, when you first started talking about like your journey. Like, what does student success actually look like then? So um, what have those changes been as a result of having this kind of new approach to, to teaching and learning? I think it makes you reevaluate what student success is. Um, like turning that back around again you think okay success is like an 80 percent in a grade and a written paper or something um but like I had um a sketch note from a student once because they said they couldn't find the words to write an essay so they sketch noted it out and I was like that is possibly maybe not the best grade in the class but it was a success because they were going to be there with a blank page otherwise 
Um, so students success is engagement, having students excited to learn, not realizing that this sketch note in that case or this animation or this like digital poster is work. They're working um, and they don't realize like they're they're coding with the spheros going around, but they're doing maths. Um, they're using like SIF playgrounds, but they're learning computer science. So it's the fact that learning is different. And I think it's something that well, for us, because we've seen those successes and we've, I guess, transformed our roles. We've seen the before and after. A lot of people think that learning should be the way we learned, um, but it, that's not success. So success is the fact that a student is happy to come to school in the day and learn whatever way they want to learn. And they may not be happy every day, but that's okay. Um, and that's, yeah, they have choice that if they want to, create a video and mute their audio that's okay and if somebody else wants to do a voiceover that's also okay so it's it's being able to adapt for them and I think the versatility of the devices and the devices being mobile allows us to adapt to different um, classes when I was teaching with my own class I changed my curriculum every time I taught it based on the students that are in my class and I, I've realized that um, now obviously working a few years um, in the same schools, um, you have this um, different students with different needs and different learning methods. The teachers are finding the same thing, like something that worked last year may not work this year, but it's good to try something else and see what success might look like, even though it might be an unexpected result. Absolutely. Richard, does that kind of mirror what, what you're seeing in terms of success and what students are creating as a result? Yeah, definitely. I think sometimes it's hard to quantify success um, in a numerical term. Uh, yes, you can do that. But sometimes the successes are less less obvious at first uh, and you start to see them over time. And sometimes those successes that you thought were going to uh, be more obvious weren't and others become um, a lot more obvious, like Miriam was saying. Um, I think that on reflection with our journey, I was talking about things that we do differently. I think we would try and track that success a lot clearer um, so that we could really show that in a, in a, in a great piece of research. Um, so one of the aspects that we're looking at this year across the trust um, is EAL children and how we can show success quantifiably for EAL children right across the trust um, and really having those um, specific, specific groups um, of children or areas uh, where you can show success. And I think ultimately we know that technology is still a bit of a Marmite issue within education. Some people love it and some people are unsure about the impact it has. So I think for us to be able to have that evidence to back up um, the, the, the power we know it has is really important. Absolutely. James, over to you. <laughs> I'll keep it short for once. I'll try anyway. Um, the, th the thing for us is we have got those numbers. Um, I did my master's research last year because I was finishing off an MSc in data analytics. That's in. So I have those quantifiable numbers that go with that. So simple ones, for example, um, on above or below is the way we grade our learners. So are they on the grade they're supposed to be? Are they above it? Are they below it? Or are they a concern? We saw 50 to 700% improvement of students moving up inside of a year with schools that went one-to-one -one compared to those that didn't have those devices at all. We even did a bit of research on schools who just changed and improved their IT in, in systems, and they went up about 100% anyway, 150%. But the one-to-one -one iPad made a massive difference. You're talking nearly 700 in some of the primaries. You know, we're talking nearly three quarters of the students moved up one or two areas in their achievement grade. And actually that was reflected on GCSEs as well. We were seeing one or two, because of the research we've done before the GCSEs came out, we were seeing one or two grade improvements compared to either predicted grades or on track grades from previous years. So that number is, in, is, is massive. You know, that's a pure achievement number, but that's not the big one for us. There are two bigger ones for us. The first one, and Richard and Miriam alluded to this, um, it's a bit of an odd number, but low level disruption. 
So what we call low-level disruption, I'm sure every, you know all the teachers on this on this call know what I mean. You know that kid that's always in and out class, always out on the outside. You know little things. I mean the le the lesson never quite goes on because you're too busy dealing with it. Eighty percent reduction where the school went one to one iPad in low level disruption. That's 80% reduction in things like demerits if your school uses them, detentions, all those kind of things. 80% as an average was the reduction in low level disruption. And then when we flipped it and gave the students a survey, we found straight away why 79% of students said they were more engaged. Now they had a one to one device than before. And actually, 85% of staff agreed their sessions were more engaging because they were changing the way they were teaching. So students were develop delivering and developing their own learning. Like Miriam said, like Richard said, Miriam, I fully get what you mean about students handing in things in different ways. It's still the same outcome. You know, I, I, my, I cut my teeth with Pearson. You know, ultimately, you're still producing the same thing. What you produce to get you there is totally up to you. Menu of assessment is a term that's used over there. We're finding that is reducing, and I've got, you know, I've got all those numbers. I had to do it for some research that's being published next year. Ultimately, all of that is there, and we track all of it. You know, pr parental perception of, of improvement is up 70%. Student improvement perception, 70, you know, 78, 79%. All these kind of things. Teachers, again, we are seeing these numbers jump, and we're not just seeing it as in people saying they're doing it. When you get into GCSE results and key stage results, we're seeing it. Primary school kids, we use a program called Reading Plus. We saw students using that on the iPad jump three years of reading age in six months. Three years of reading age. And that was tracked against schools that didn't and did it in different ways. So we're not predisposing the iPads for an improvement point. And again, some of this is, is not just the iPads being there. It's actually this whole changing of ethos to student student centered, student delivered, you know, teacher led. But it's not just the iPads, but the iPads are acting at, acting as a catalyst for change. And yes, as Richard said, there are still lots of people out there that say this can't be done. It's something else that's driving it. And I get that. And I, I, I'm i a little bit of an oddball because I taught computer science. So I'm sort of already on the inside, which, you know, Matt, you taught sports. You're on the outside. So you can be like this. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but you know what I mean? That whole ethos change, we're seeing it. All those numbers are coming out there and I can quantify all of them. So that's been a big win for us. You know, not only that, but also um, the students themselves just coming up and going, this is making my life easier. You know, one kid, it's a, it's one of those weird stories. She she grabbed me on a corridor um, earlier this year and she went, uh, Mr. Jackson, yeah, can I say thank you? What for? She went, I haven't been kicked out of a lesson in a year. I was like, why did you used to get kicked out of a lesson? She was like, because I never wanted to feel thick. So I used to Google the answers on my phone and I get kicked out for Googling the answers on my phone. I don't need to anymore. So this kid was classed as pure low level disruption because she was completely Googling the answers because she didn't want to look stupid. And it was being classed as actually a, a problem. Whereas now the iPad's in front of her, she's doing it anyway and she feels empowered with her learning. What a difference that makes. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, just in danger of possibly going off on one myself <laughs> now and I, I, will, I will hold myself back. I think... You know, something that we see with technology enhanced learning is it's not the iPad, Richard. You, you know, you, you talk to this. There's a lot of skepticism about technology that doesn't change anything. And absolutely right. It doesn't on its own. But when, Miriam, you spoke to this, people doing something different to the way they did it before. Um, and even if it was just last year, because the people in front of you are different. When we start to realize those individuals in front of us have a different way to connect, whether that's 30 different ways in one lesson or just different to the way we did it last year, that's when we start to see change. Um, it's not only engaging for students. I think it also engages teachers in a new way. You know, we you get bored of doing the same thing year on, year out. Um, you question yourself, well, well, I did this last year and it worked fine. Why is it not working this year? And, you know, by actually just doing something different, it makes your life easier. So I think that's a, that's a really, really powerful message and, and great to hear the statistics that go with it because, as we all know, sometimes you do need the statistics to kind of just just help people understand that this actually has an impact in the classroom as well um okay you've alluded to it although you did say that i was a pe teacher so you almost like knocked me down a level but we we all understand how technology works right we're all in roles where we support people with technology what about 
staff, parents, other stakeholders that aren't maybe in that fortunate position to have kind of embraced it and engaged in it in these different ways? Like, how do we support those people when you could see the potential distractions that exist? We know that exists. You know, you you can see it if you've got children of your own, et cetera, or, or you know, out on the streets. Technology can be a distraction. How do we kind of combat that within education? I'll start with this one. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think a lot of people in particular with iPads think it's the iPad they got from at home from the computer store for Christmas. Um, but uh, they don't see that there is there's Jamf, there's managed Apple IDs, that there is these privacy settings, security settings, all these other things, Apple Classroom, Jamf Classroom there. So they're thinking of this toy this one that you play games on, they're not seeing it as an educational one. And I think that exists um, out there, but it's showing that it that it's not. So that is one of the challenges I think anyone that goes into a school, like we do have, there is this misconception that, yeah, you just use commercial IDs, that it's, it's just your standard device. So managed Apple IDs has been like one thing I've made to schools. I had one school that wasn't, um, they were just, not because they they were set up long before I came along so now they're managed IDs um and that's that's a start because there's obviously restrictions within there kids can't um do a number of things as a result of that um all their devices are enrolled um so we can track them because that's another fear they're like oh yeah you'll just walk it you'll take that ipad home and we'll never see it again you, you can track these things <laughs> um but also like things like apple classroom that we can tell that a kid has spent 40 minutes on YouTube and not in uh, whatever they're meant to be doing. Um, we call that up. We normally do that at the very start of the year. We lock down their devices. We show them, oh, we can see your screens. Honestly, when I was doing it with my class, I would show them at the start of the year. I would do it for a class or two, and I probably wouldn't open up Classroom unless there was an issue other than that. So, um, but they knew that we could always do that. And then you'd remind them every now and then if they needed to. So it's a different device. It is a device that's made for education and with the supports and the systems and the management systems in place, it is a device that works. Um, the other thing we have is we invite parents um, or the schools I work with, they invite parents in for open evenings and they proudly show their iPads and they show their portfolios or their drawings. Um, so everything is on display and there's no secret. There is no like trying to hold back what you're doing in school. All these kids are playing games all day. They're not. Um, the, so the schools are really good at communicating um, the educational benefits of this. And it's been really good to hear all like the, the statistics in particular that James has had today, like that this is really working. It's not just in our heads <laughs> um, that these, like we've all seen the um, increased grade or or the better grades or the students engaging but like the statistics are out there that proves that it is actually working as well yeah Richard what about your kind of setup again you know in a school scaling this out I'm sure you've got lots of teachers which are a little bit you know nervous about having this in place like how do you put their minds at rest about things yeah I think Miriam touched on it perfectly uh the tools and apps we've got available um, so that this isn't just a, a commercial device or a toy that we can um, have complete control over it so that the children are doing what they're supposed to be. And like James said, that it's not another distraction that teachers have to be mindful of. Um, that is a, it is a device purely that will enhance teaching and learning. So, yes, one of our top five strategies is the Apple Classroom app and just how that can completely be used as a behaviour management tool. But also, like Miriam says um, previously at Mia Green, Yes, we've used it. Um, we use it more now to actually enhance checking for understanding. So by the teachers being able to see the screen of the device, we're not necessarily checking they're doing the right thing, but we can check the students' progress a lot faster and a lot more children than um, just going around the class one at a time. So we've actually started using it less as a behaviour management tool and more to enhance checking for understanding. But I think having that tool where teachers know they can lock students in apps, they can uh, lock devices of one individual or multiple individuals or whole class is a game changer because it puts their their minds at ease just like the jamf tools such as jamf parent jamf teacher uh, which we're looking at 
piloting at some of our schools across the trust because we know that parents are the stakeholder that needs to be engaged the most. Um, and I think if we look back at uh, our journey at Mir Green and what we do differently again is that parental engagement. Um, we, we struggled at first, um, but the, the game changer for us was COVID and the provision we were able to provide for them. Uh, scaling across the trust, bringing in tools like Jump Parent very, very early on, bringing teach, uh, uh, parents into the school, doing a work, a workshop, showing them how it's used, etc., so that their, their minds are at ease. Absolutely. Um, probably a distance from me then is um, very similar to what Miriam and Richard have said, but we always start the same way. So teaching staff get them six to eight weeks before the kids. And I go in and do the first training session every single time, no matter which school it is, it's me, the, I'm the first thing they see. So I will go through and give them, I always, I Nick Apple's phrase here, the art of the possible. So I go and give them, here's a load of interesting things you can try and do, go play. And they get six weeks with an Apple TV in a classroom. They can throw stuff at the kids. They can try different things, play. At the end of those six weeks, I've already had the conversations with the head. We've worked out what their through route is going to be. We've got a default PowerPoint that all the kids get. So when the kids go one-to-one, -one, they work over a number of weeks. But we make staff do it in a fortnight. So for the kids, it's designed to be like half an hour every 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 other day over the number of weeks. Staff, we do it in a fortnight. So they get to learn all the tools before the kids do. So we work it through really quickly with them. We then ask them, we do what call ask the expert. And we do this again with Sync, who do all of our partner work and with Jamf as well. We ask the experts, so we put some sessions on where staff can drop in from all over the trust to go, I want to do this, how? Or they just email me. Uh, but these sessions are really to give them that open thing. And it's not just us that's doing it. It's them giving themselves answers. So, you know, they'll pop something in and one of the math teachers from one of our other schools will go, here, what about trying this? Geography teacher, you know, sports, food tech, whatever. Then we get to the kids. So the first thing we do is, as I've said before, all of our apps are the same. So every school has exactly the same list. We've got a difference between primary and secondary, but ultimately there is a default list for each one, and that's what they get. If they want it adding to that, they come to me like they do with Miriam. Um, but on top of that, we then get the parents in. So all of our iPads go home. So we get them in, they sign to say they're going to, be, they're going to look after them. The parents get a proper assembly on what we expect from the kids. You know, this is not babysitting with an iPad. We are going to use them. There are things they're going to do. And the kids get that as well. So they sit with their parents in the assembly and they all sign the form, say, yes, it's going to be done. We video record it. So if any parents can't make it, it goes out to them. And we do that by school or by year group, depending on the size of the school. Then the kids come in, they get their iPads in a proper assembly. We go through expectations, management, all the rest of it. And during that week, I'll do a second training session with staff. That's the reinforcement, the Apple classroom, as Miriam and Richard have very clearly said, you know, making them feel comfortable. They can keep an eye on what the kids are doing and use that to enhance what the kids, you know, look at what Matt has done. Show it up on the screen. Look at what Miriam's done. Show it up on the screen and enhance that, removing the front. And then from that, we have this very structured training program with the kids that everyone follows. So although these schools are all operating at different times, they're all operating in the same way, which means that... It builds it in and then using things like jump parent um and you know the tools like Shobi and um seesaw whichever one we've got in um uh the other one i forget which one but there's loads of different tools that parents we have at different schools and then we also offer right on top of all that we offer out training programs to parents so if the parents feel completely underconfident we offer once or twice a term uh come in during the school day there's one before and one after the school day if you don't want to tell your kids that's fine come in, we will talk you through what their iPad is and how to use the bits so you feel comfortable with what your kids are doing and how to use the devices, not just thinking, I can't help here. So we re and we try and show them things like if they're using Shobi, how Shobi works so they can talk their kid through it, they can see how their homework is. So we do all of that. We, we do like a proper parental focused sessions as well as teaching staff and kids because it's everybody and then also some stuff on strategy with SLT. But it's we have to hit each block separately because each one has a very different outcome on it. Absolutely. I love that. And, and Richard mentioned Jamf Teacher in there. So a bit of self-publicity here. If you've not seen Jamf Teacher, I'm doing a, a, a kind of hands-on session on it tomorrow. So um, if you want to know more about what that looks like and how that uh, is a companion app for Apple Classroom, join in. 
in tomorrow's sessions. Um, I'm going to I'm going to kind of carry on from where James was talking there about the training because I think training is really really important. Um, so, Miriam, Richard, how how are you making sure that staff that you work with um, are capable at meeting the needs of the students? Because you've kind of highlighted, and James, you mentioned this: students sometimes will just go right. How do we make sure that our staff are capable of doing that? And any kind of tips that you want to share? Yeah, I think James, you've touched on this a few times, and it's making uh, giving the staff the device before uh, the children. So we followed the same approach um, for our staff that are rolling uh, for our schools where children are rolling out in January. Uh, staff got their device in July, just before the end of summer so we wanted to give them we, it's a huge transformation for staff going from a laptop to a to an ipad a new operating system a complete change we wanted that buy-in and we wanted to show them that this is a journey of going on together um so the first thing we did was ensure that they had a lot of time to get used to it uh, and the first thing we started to to do is we can, we can well we can start to really start enhancing um the classroom without the children necessarily even having the ipads by the teacher being able to have Apple Classroom, uh, sorry, um, uh, Apple TV, modelling with the Apple Pencil, not being as tied to the front, not having to turn around and use a visualiser so they're not facing the front of the class. Those simple things that can start them on that process um, to really buying into uh, the power of technology. So that's what we're starting to see across our schools. Um, the next thing then is making sure that we've got a sustained CPD programme um, that is continuous, not just uh, one event that launches everything and it's fantastic it's 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 wow it wows everyone but then it's not talked about again it's ensuring that we've got um, a trust wide for us sustained cpd program um, across for us it'll be a two-year rolling cycle so again we've got the top five of the digital classroom so looking at uh, explanation and modeling for um through uh, uh apple tv and airplay um apple classroom uh We've got assessment, accessibility, and then workflow with Shobi. So our CPD will revolve around those five things. They're the key aspects. Yes, like James said, we'll have people flying and starting to use other, other apps like um, iMovie, Garage Bands. That's fantastic. We'll put on separate things for our regional training centre for people um, who are flying. But for us, it's making sure that we all work together and we're going through it um, at a sort of steady pace around those five things. Um, and when for us, you you're doing something almost like a big bang at trust wide um all at the same time it's trying to manage it in that way and that's the way we've we've, we've we think will be uh the most impactful excellent miriam this is kind of your job right so so yeah <laughs> so i can't mess up the answer in this one <laughs> So, yeah, no, um, I kind of learned a lot what works. Obviously, um, as Richard said, he has a, an, an Apple Regional Training Center. We have an Apple Regional Training Center as well. And we would have had, I don't know, thousands by now teachers that would have come through that. And we've kind of catered if a teacher wants something, we try to put it on. Um, now I'm doing that all day, every day. My work is kind of secondary to that. And a lot of teachers that would have attended are now in their schools, which makes it easier um, for me. But like our base one is a teacher has to be Apple teacher to have an iPad. Um, and I know it's only your pages, keynote number is um, iPad, I may be garage band, but it's a commitment. And what makes me really happy is when I have a skill and they're like, you have a month. Well, we support, we did like this mass rollout last year um, where every teacher, man, member of management, everybody, no one, there was no excuses. Everybody had to get it. Um, and then this year, any new staff had to get it. But the fact that it's, it's not coming from me um, makes it um, mean a lot more. And it's expected to have that in another school. We have uh, like a limited number of teacher iPads. And if you're not an Apple teacher, it's tough. Um, so it's just if you really want your iPad, you go get it. And we learned that from another um, a principal um, in another school in the country. She said her whole strategy when she became principal in her school was she would say become Apple teacher and you get an iPad so she would go in and she would present a teacher with an iPad when they got their status so that's the very start obviously you can't just get that badge and stop um so the other thing that we do is like I will go into any 
um, classroom. If a principal tells me this year I'm in maths, next year I'm in geography, I don't mind. I'm not the subject expert. I would like to say I'm the expert in using the device, but alongside the subject expert, I can make that happen. So I'm not the teacher, they're the teacher, and I'm just showing them how to integrate the the device into their classroom. So that's what's kind of worked, the fact that it's constantly hands-on. And another thing, um, teachers like to see me fail and I fail on a daily basis. And that makes them feel better by failing too. Um, so they always say, oh, it's great to see this not working for you because it's not gonna work for them. It's not gonna work for a student. Things don't work <laughs> um, sometimes, um, especially when you expect them to work. Um, but I think you have to not be afraid to fail or to have something broken and need to say, oh, I need to get you an answer on that tomorrow. Um, and maybe just not know that's important as well, because things, you know, tech, it doesn't always work as you expect it to. And um, we have to not be afraid to make mistakes as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll pick up on that. My, my previous role being in higher ed and teacher training um, I think one of those things that we would always tell them and not just not just to do with technology right but sometimes showing children that we're not perfect because that can be really off-putting to a child in the classroom and that doesn't change when we're working with adults right adults are just bigger children as far as I'm concerned when we're training them um, they will do the same things they will have the same complaints um, and you're right you know we, if you can show that kind of calmness when things go wrong, that's a great lesson in itself, you know, even beyond the teaching them how the device works, teaching them how to deal with it not working is is just as just as good because we know, yep, yeah, you're right, sometimes these things go wrong and we can't necessarily just blame the tech. We how do we persevere? And that that is a lesson to learn as is is really powerful. But I'm not gonna go all lecture mode and go back into higher education. I will I will move on from there. Um, I've think... got one last question. So go on. Oh, if you want to, yeah. to, to, to go back to the last point as well, I think sustained CPD is massively important. But one thing that we're working on as well is building that internal capacity. So our partners think offer fantastic training, fantastic support. Um, and we really do appreciate that. And it's a partnership that will be moving forward. But we can't just rely on them. We've got to build support within house as well. So for us, it's looking at those um, sort of key champions from across school and providing them with the uh, the training the support so that we can build that internal um, sort of training program as well so like Miriam said we have um, we're building towards 100% Apple teachers across trust and teaching assistants but where do we go from there looking at the um, the Apple learning approach potentially up to APLS how can we build that internal capacity so that we're um, sort of allowing for the trainers within the trust as well yeah, yeah. similar that goes around scale, scale, doesn't it? yeah yeah similar was matt like you got background in pgc training like you have i built you know we've built digital learning professionals a bit like what richie was saying so we've got people who are digital learning specialists spread across the trust we have a learning hub for digital for the we have two or three of them actually it's focused in subject areas and you're right grow your own because as good as our external providers are you know sync are amazing so a jump we've still got to be able to have that and actually they believe it more if it's their own saying it than if it's one of us saying it, it it's the inside looking out approach isn't it absolutely okay um looking at the time just wanted to kind of ask one kind of like tip from you. So if there's any organizations that are kind of part of this today or watching this on, on recap and they're thinking of starting a one-to-one -one journey, what's one piece of advice that you would give? Miriam, we'll, we'll start with you. I think for us what worked, um, we visited back then, we had to hop on a plane and go to Birmingham and visit um, a school in Birmingham and see it. We spent a couple of days there and we saw what iPads looked like in that school. And yeah, iPads were ordered like literally the next day. Um, thankfully, we have wonderful schools in Cork now across Ireland that have yeah. iPads. You need to see it yourself. You need to see it and you need to see, then you can vision yourself in um, that classroom. Um, you can talk, visit us, watch all the YouTube videos, attend all the events, but until you actually see the engagement and those magic moments with students um, in their classroom, I think that's the biggest thing. And also communicate. There is a really big um, like Apple education community, Jamf community, 
community that there's people out there to ask for help ask for advice ask how they did it when things don't work where you get your help so it's not being alone but also seeing um it works somewhere else um preferably in your local community um we, that i think um is one thing like we didn't have that opportunity when we did that because it was so long ago but um visit somewhere in your local community that has a setup and see what works for you uh, richard yeah i think that's a great point for miriam and the thing um in addition to that, it's showing staff the benefit to them. Yes, obviously, it's children come first, but how can it benefit the staff? Showing them how much it can reduce the workload, increase efficiencies, how it can uh, save time. Is that, for me, that initial buy-in? Once they see what it can do for them, I think they'll be more on board with trying to really buy into it. And I think one of the sort of unintended outcomes we've seen from that for us is our um, increased sort of staff retention um, staff say that, and this is sort of looking at one of the reasons across the trust as well, is that staff don't want to leave because they know that the, the technology they have is so far better than what they could have at another school. And the sort of efficiencies that are made and the time savings, they don't want to leave to go to another school. So for us, being able to do that across the trust means that we can keep our staff and um, sort of grow them and promote them uh, and keep them within, within our uh, Mort Academy Trust. Yeah, great tips. Um, probably for me, it's sort of one point leading to another. The first one is get it right. What I mean is, you know, the comments we made at the start, get your infrastructure right, get the stuff you need to support the one-to-one -one strategy right before you do the one-to-one -one strategy because it's the canary. If it croaks, it ain't going anywhere. So ultimately, you know, for me, get your other stuff right. You know, if you haven't got good Wi-Fi, get it right. Get your broadband right. Do all that kind of stuff first. Get your infrastructure. I know that's the boring stuff, but get your infrastructure right first and then teacher led because ultimately we can, we, we give a strategy. and that's the way I've always done. I will give her where I want you to be. You lead it. So, so give the staff that freedom to develop and go, here's what I found. Here's what I found. Here's what I found. Here's what I found. Because, and I, it, I'm a, my, my teaching career has been lived by um, Socrates and you'll all know the quote. I mean, education is the kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel. I am not here to tell you how to use your iPad. I'm here to give you a few things that you can go for. You light the flame, you go after it. Same thing I've always done in my teaching career. If the, if, if the person in front of me is enthusiastic enough to go and do something and learn about themselves, I've done my job because that will be far more beneficial to them. So, you know, so it's for me, it's that get your infrastructure, get your baseline right. Once that's there, get your staff enthusiastic and get them going. Let them lead it because it's always going to be better coming from them. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, and like, so just to go back to Miriam's point, um, I'm going to plug the Jamf Nation Education uh, Forum. Great place for people to kind of go in and tell their stories. And, and the more people that tell their stories, the more people you can connect with and find those you know, fantastic opportunities to change the lives of children, which I think is what we're all talking about here is, is giving those opportunities. Um, we, we've come to the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much for what's been a really, really insightful conversation. You know, I, I could probably go on for hours and hours. I love talking about technology and how it empowers learners. Um, but thank you so much for everybody for sharing your um, valuable insights and tips and ideas. Um, and then also thanks to all of our viewers for joining in, whether you're watching this live um, or watching this on replay. And we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow for more sessions as well. So again, thank you very much for joining in.